Hi, this is Tim Weber from South Texas College coming to you with another video, this one on learning. In fact, this will be the first of three on learning. Uh, in this one, we'll introduce the topic and then focus on classical conditioning. Uh, the following one, we will look at operant conditioning. And the third one, we'll look at other types of learning, such as social learning. So uh, to start off with, I thought I would uh, show you some examples of learned behavior uh, to get you thinking about this whole topic. And so let me see if I can bring up, um, here we go. So this is um, Thomas. He is uh, one of my dogs and uh, I have uh, trained him to do a few things. So here's one of the things that he's learned to do. Uh, you will note that he was not born doing this, uh, but it was something that he learned through a process of conditioning, which we'll be studying. So we're hiding his leash here. And now he has to go over here. Uh, and then we're going to tell him to go and look for his leash and bring it to me. So there he goes. And there it is. Okay, so you might be wondering, how did I get him to do that? And we'll be getting into some of the types of learning that can be uh, used to produce such behavior, uh, not only with dogs, but also with humans, actually. So let's see, this next one. Um, he is finding a hidden target this time. And so first he has to go over and he has to sit on his climb. And oops, a little error. He says, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now he waits while I go and I hide the object, this little cone, uh, which we used as a target for this particular little trick that he learned. <clears throat> there it is. And then here he is. He's still over there uh, where he's supposed to be sitting on his climb. And now I'm telling him to go and find the target, bring it to me. He doesn't know where it is. So I have to encourage him a little bit to look for it. And he has found it, and there he comes. Okay, so there's another example for you. And let's see if I can give you a third one here. Okay, so this one is a little bit more involved. There you go. All right. I don't know what happened with this picture. It's all out of proportion. Uh, yeah, I'm fat, but not that fat. So I don't know what happened here, but you can see what he's doing. So there he is. Okay. You'll notice I actually had a haircut at this time. That's a couple years ago before the pandemic and my hair grew long. <laughs> okay. All right. So there you go, there's another example. All right, so then let's get into then the actual topic of just what do we mean in psychology when we talk about learning. So learning is defined uh, by psychologists as a relatively permanent change in an organism's behavior due to experience. So notice this is going to be a behavior, something that can be observed, which has changed from what was seen previously. So a different behavior, uh, relatively permanent. And by that, we mean that this will be, um, will be exhibited repeatedly over a period of time, not just a one-time thing. And, due to experience. So the change in behavior 
is not due to the organism being tired, fatigued, sick, under the influence of a drug, um, maturation, none of those things, but rather it's due to some experience which that organism has ha had. When we look at learned behavior, <clears throat> you'll note that it gives a survival advantage. Now, <clears throat> this might be contrasted with instinctive behavior. For example, the reproductive behavior of the Chinook salmon. The salmon uh, fish uh, hatches in a stream somewhere, and then it swims out to the ocean and swims around for a couple years, comes back, and it um, must go back to the same stream where it hatched in order to reproduce. If the stream is blocked off or if it dries up, that salmon is out of luck when it comes to reproduction. Now, consider that it is bound by instinctive behavior. Uh, it is unable to learn other ways of behaving. Now, uh, in contrast, humans don't have to go to the same place they conceived in order to reproduce. Can you imagine? I'd have to find the back seat of a 1957 Chevy or something. Never mind that. Uh, but uh, yeah, humans have been able to learn to reproduce in many varied situations. So that gives us something of a survival advantage in able to reproduce. So learning allows us to adjust our behavior to changes in our environment, uh, to find new ways to do things advantageous. So how do we learn? Well, uh, they have discovered that we learn primarily by association. Our brains are just naturally geared to connect events that occur one after the other in sequence and associate those events one with another. So we talk about associative learning and we're going to just touch on a couple types of it here. First, we have classical conditioning. Classical conditioning occurs when we have learned to associate one stimulus with another. Or another way to say that, we have learned to associate one event with another event that follows it consistently. So this was demonstrated in experiments that Eric Candle did with sea snails. Now sea snails live in the water. So normally splashing water on them doesn't do anything. But what Candle did is he would splash water on a snail and then he would, um, would subject it to a tail shock, a mild electrical shock. Now, when snails encounter something unpleasant, like a shock, what do they do? Well, they pull back into their shell, right? So, of course, under this circumstance, the snail pulls its tail, uh, pulls itself back into its shell because of the electrical shock. Candle then repeats the procedure a number of times. Splash of water, shock. Splash of water, shock. Splash of water, shock. And so forth for a few times. And then he simply splashes water on the snail. There's no shock, but what does the snail do? It pulls back into its shell. Why? Because it has learned to associate getting splashed with water with receiving that tail shock. So it is, if you will, anticipating that shock to come and behaving as if it had already occurred. So the snail is responding to the first event as if it was the second. It has learned to associate these two stimuli or two events. Of course, this can happen also with humans as well. And so here's an example, um, powerful lightning and thunder. 
I don't know if you've ever been anywhere where lightning has struck close by, I mean, within yards from where you're at, but it's really, really intense. Uh, I was in a car that was hit by lightning once. Yeah, maybe that's why I'm so strange, right? But anyways, uh, wow, it took quite a while uh, to actually just be able to hear again after that happened. So let's suppose we have a child and lightning strikes right near where they're at. The lightning is followed just a few milliseconds later by powerful thunder. It is quite likely that even after just one exposure of this intense experience, when he sees lightning, he may begin to wince, anticipating the loud thunder that uh, had come right after that previous event. So we can see this occurring in humans as well. Now let's shift to a different type of learning, also associative learning called operant conditioning. In this type of learning, we learn to associate making some response with the consequence that that response brings about. So we learn to associate, if you will, doing some behavior with what consequence that behavior brings. So here's an example. Let's suppose that you were working for SeaWorld and um, uh, they wanted to have the seal balance the ball on its nose more than it does now. And it does that sometimes just out of boredom. They wanted to do it more. So how could you as the trainer get it to do that more often? And of course you're saying, oh, that's simple. Whenever you see it balancing the ball, give it, you might call it a reward, but cause the consequence to be that the seal receives food. And what will happen? The behavior of balancing the ball is strengthened by that uh, enjoyable consequence that the seal receives. And so the seal begins balancing the ball more often, okay? So operant conditioning behavior is modified uh, by its consequence. So that's another way to say it. Behavior is influenced by its consequence. Now, here's an example, a human example of operant conditioning, similar situation. Let's say you're hungry and you got some money in your pocket and you pass a candy machine. So you put in the money, press the buttons, and out comes a delicious candy bar, which you enjoy. What are you more likely to do now when you're hungry, have money in your pocket, and pass the candy machine? You're more likely to repeat that behavior. And the more often you repeat it, the stronger the behavior come, becomes. So this is operant conditioning. Now, we might just also tack on a couple other scenarios that also illustrate other aspects of operant conditioning. The example we just talked about is where reinforcement is going on. And we'll explain that in more detail later. But the behavior is being strengthened by the consequence you receive. Now, let's say something else happens. Let's say that you have been going there and putting money in, pressing the buttons, receiving a delicious candy bar uh, over and over again to where it's become almost a habit. And one day you go over there, put the money in, press the buttons, get out the candy bar, start eating, and you say, ugh, something tastes funny about this candy bar. And you look at it, it's full of worms. Um, what's likely to happen now to this behavior of putting money in the machine and pressing the buttons? you're probably not going to do it because rather than getting something reinforcing the consequence of the behavior this time was something that was intensely unpleasant what we actually call punishment and so you're likely to discontinue that behavior let me give you a third scenario of operant conditioning while we're here let's uh, erase that that I just talked about, okay? And let's say, again, you have been daily enjoying candy from that machine, pressing the buttons and 
getting the uh, candy out and so forth. And so one day you go there, put the money in, um, press buttons, nothing happens. So you shake it, you kick it, you call the number that's on there, and you can't get your candy. Okay, now it's going to happen. Probably you're going to quit putting money in that machine. Now, maybe you might try it once more uh, on another day just to see if that was a fluke thing. But if it happens twice, three times, you're going to stop doing that. And this is another aspect of operant conditioning that we call extinction, where a learned response uh, is discontinued due to a lack of reinforcement. So that's a little bit about that. We're gonna go into a lot more detail in a little while. Okay, so let's go into more detail about classical conditioning then. So I always wondered why it was called classical conditioning. I finally found out the reason for it is this was something that was actually observed by uh, classic Greek philosophers. And so because of that, then they called it classical conditioning. Uh, the first person to really study this in any detail, though, was Ivan Pavlov, who was a Russian physiologist studying how the body works. And he was doing experiments with dogs, trying to understand how saliva uh, played a part in digestion. And so he had apparatus where he could collect the saliva of dogs and measure how many drops dogs were producing and so forth. But he was having trouble with his experiments because he found the dogs to be salivating at times when he didn't intend them to do it. He found that the dogs would salivate when they heard the footsteps of the assistant who fed them or when they saw someone who wore a white jacket like the assistant who fed them. They would salivate when they heard their food dishes being washed. And so he finally got kind of uh, disgusted with trying to complete his studies and decided he just wanted to know why were these dogs salivating to things that they weren't actually going to eat. That didn't seem to make any sense. Why were they producing these, as he called them, psychic secretions? So anyways, so what he did is he began to then study it. Okay, so we'll get back to what he found out. Um, as we do that, what he found out was that through repeated pairing, the first stimulus, whatever it was, became associated with a second, such that you could have respondent behavior where the organism responds to the first event as if it was the second. Now that's probably kind of confusing, but you'll understand as we go along. So in order to actually discuss this whole topic, you'll need to get familiar with some terminology. So here we go. First of all, in classical conditioning, you have what's called an unconditioned stimulus, and sometimes we'll abbreviate US or UCS. This is an event that activates a reflex. So as an example, food activates the salivary reflex, and food then produces what? Produces an unconditioned response. Unconditioned response then <clears throat> is the reflex response to an unconditioned stimulus. Notice that this is not a learned response. This is built into the nervous system of a person or animal. So food being placed in the mouth produces a reflex response of salivation. Food unconditioned stimulus, salivating unconditioned response. No conditioning was needed. Now, another example would be a loud noise. Loud noise that you're not expecting produces a startle response, okay? So it's a reflex response. Or if we take a light and we shine a little flashlight right in your eyeball, 
what will happen? You have the reflex of pupil contraction, right? Your pupil will contract, even if you're asleep and we can pry your eyeball open without uh, waking you up, that will happen, okay? And notice it's involuntary as well, right? It's, it's, it's automatic. You don't have to even be conscious or awake for that reflex to occur. Or if we have a puff of air that hits your eyeball, what happens? Eye blink, automatic again. So unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. Now, we have a third type of stimulus in classical conditioning that we call a neutral stimulus, abbreviated NS sometimes. The neutral stimulus is some event that does not activate any reflex action does not activate a reflex. So a neutral stimulus then can become a conditioned stimulus, which we may abbreviate CS, okay? So a conditioned stimulus then begins as a neutral stimulus. The neutral stimulus then being paired repeatedly with an unconditioned stimulus, one of those things we saw on the previous screen, then becomes associated with it. We'd say conditioning occurs such that this stimulus that was previously neutral now can trigger a condition learn response. So what was a neutral stimulus now is going to trigger a response. And what is that response? It's going to be a condition response. You can abbreviate that CR. So a condition response now is a learned response. It's not naturally built in. It's elicited by a condition stimulus, the thing that was previously neutral that didn't do anything before. And why does this happen? Because that conditioned stimulus was repeatedly paired up with an unconditioned stimulus. Now, you're probably thinking, gosh, this is like a bunch of double talks. So might be still kind of funny, uh, funny, fuzzy. So let's go ahead and look at an actual example because that always makes it easier to understand. So let's have a look at Pavlov's dogs that we talked about earlier. So before Pavlov did his conditioning experiments, if you place food in a dog's mouth, well, it salivates. Why does it salivate? Well, it's a reflex. It's just natural built in to the dog's nervous system. So at this point, we would say, Food placed in a dog's mouth is an unconditional stimulus triggering that reflex response of salivating, which we would refer to as an unconditional response at this point. Now, at this point, Pavlov can sound a tone and nothing happens. No salivating, no reflex response. So we have to say, well, the tone is at this point a neutral stimulus, doesn't produce any saliva. Now, Pavlov then begins a conditioning process where he sounds a tone and immediately places food in the dog's mouth and the dog salivates. No surprise because after all, food was placed in its mouth. He repeats that procedure pairing up the neutral stimulus, the, the tone, with the food numerous times and then moves to the next step where he simply sounds the tone and lo and behold, the dog now salivates to the tone. No food required. So we can now say the tone has become a conditioned stimulus. It's not neutral anymore. Now it's triggering a response and that response, even though it's the same response as before, is a conditioned response because it's now happening to a new stimulus. It's a learned response now. So condition response at this point. Okay, so that's the basics of this. 
And one of the things you might have to do, you might have to go over it a few times. I know I sure did when I first learned it, okay? Let's look at an example with humans. And let me see if I can get that up on the screen. I have to do all kinds of things to get it on the screen for you. Uh, this is gonna involve mm, a football and a baby and bath time. Let's see if I can get it up there for you. Okay, I think I go here. And then I go, I went the wrong place. Uh, there it is. Uh, I got a thing that's getting in my way. Here we go, finally. Okay, so let's watch. There we go. Okay. So there he is having his bath. He's getting sprayed with some cold water from a plastic football. Not a real pleasant thing. Uh-oh, he doesn't like it. Now you notice he tenses up every time the football's brought near him. Don't even have to spray the water on him. He's giving the same response that uh, he would if he's actually getting uh, the cold water. So this is a, another example of that. Let's see if I can get that stopped now. There we go. So this is readily observed in humans as well. And notice, yes, you don't even have to be able to think like an adult for this to occur, okay? So in classical conditioning then, the acquisition phase is the time where that association between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus is building up in the uh, nervous system. So this is where this association is being formed. There are a couple of things that they have learned that uh, enable acquisition of a new uh, learned behavior, a new uh, classical condition, condition response. The first thing they found out is the neutral stimulus needs to be presented before the unconditioned stimulus. So in Pavlov's experiments, if he had put food in the dog's mouth first and then sounded its tone, he might never have gotten them to salivate to a tone. Uh, maybe, maybe with maybe thousands of trials, uh, something like that, but generally that's not gonna work. So the neutral stimulus has to appear before the unconditioned stimulus. If it continues on through when the unconditioned stimulus is present, so much the better, okay? So the order of these stimuli, condition and unconditioned, neutral and unconditioned matters. Secondly, they found out that the best time, uh, time lag between the presentation of the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, about a half a second. So if you will, for all practical purposes, you can say, present the unconditioned stimulus immediately after the neutral stimulus, for all practical purposes immediately, okay? So if we do that, now on the other hand, if there is a longer time delay between these two, then we are less and less likely to produce that condition response uh, as the time delay gets longer and longer, or it may take more conditioning trials to get it to occur if there are delays in there. And sometimes there'll be some other things that will happen that we'll go into later. So this acquisition then of classically conditioned responses may explain some things that otherwise seem really weird. And here's an example. Okay, speaking of that half second before unconditioned stimulus thing. Um, our textbook's author, uh, 
uh, David Myers tells about a friend that he had when he was in college. And this guy seemed kind of weird because he, he uh, enjoyed onion breath. In fact, he kind of found onion breath to be sexy and erotic. You say, well, how in the world could anybody be like that? Was he born that way? Probably not. Here's probably what happened. Okay, for most college age guys, a passionate kiss would be an unconditioned stimulus that triggers a reflex response of some level of sexual arousal. And so for those of you who are not familiar with that, well, maybe someday you will find out, okay? So unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. So this guy has a girlfriend that likes to eat foods with onions on it. So every time he gets that passionate kiss from her, what does he get about a half second before the kiss? A whiff of that onion breath. So notice that after this has been paired up numerous times, now he actually finds onion breath to be sexy. The onion breath has become a conditioned stimulus triggering a conditioned response of sexual arousal. I know some of you are devious and you're now thinking of all kinds of interesting things that you could do with that. Um, yeah, it's up to you to figure out what to do with it. Okay. So Pavlov also discovered that once you had a conditioned stimulus, you could pair it up with a new neutral stimulus and you could turn this new neutral stimulus into a conditioned stimulus as well. So let me show you how that works. So let's say Pavlov has a dog who is salivating to a tone. Conditioned stimulus tone, salivating conditioned response. Now what he can do is he can introduce a light as a neutral stimulus. It doesn't do anything now, but if he pairs that up with the tone and presents it right before the tone each time, the dog eventually will also salivate to the light. No tone required. This is what we call higher order conditioning. Now this also can be chained several levels beyond the original neutral stimulus. This might help to explain why stimuli that are far removed from the original one can sometimes produce a response that, again, might be quite mysterious. So think about this one. Um, if you've um, ever been to the dentist, you might have experienced something painful there at the dentist. And you might even find that now, if you get a phone call that reminds you of your dentist appointment, that you become a bit anxious. But why is that? Well, we might say that numerous other stimuli that came before the actual stimulus of uh, feeling pain in the dentist's office uh, have been chained to that uh, particular uh, pain. So um, you were in the dentist chair when you felt the pain. So you associate the dentist chair with pain. It makes you real nervous there. But the uh, waiting room that you were in before also might produce anxiety. Why? Because that's where you were right before you got into the dentist chair. Um, you might find that hmm, <laughs> even before you sit down in the waiting room, just that funny dentist office smell. I don't know why they must have some spray that makes it smell that way, or I don't know. But anyways, uh, might even kind of, you start feeling nervous when you smell that. You know? Well, because that's the first thing you smelled when you're in there. And what you experienced there at the dental's, dentist office was preceded by a phone call reminding you to, uh, to go there. So all of those neutral stimuli might be all chained to that pain that you got in the dentist chair and now just getting that phone call starts making you nervous. Okay, now one thing that can occur once a condition response is produced is called extinction. So this is when 
the unconditioned stimulus no longer follows the conditioned stimulus, then the con conditioned response decreases, eventually ceases. So let's look at it in terms of Pavlov and the dogs. So here we have Pavlov training the dog to salivate to the tone. The dog is salivating strongly here, lots of saliva. And so Pavlov now begins sounding the tone without providing the food. Each time he does it, notice that the amount of saliva being produced decreases. And as he continues to do this, he continues to sound the tone without providing the food. Eventually the dog will cease salivating to the tone entirely. So this is called extinction. Now, to illustrate this, maybe in your terms, uh, let's say that you decide you're gonna do something like Pavlov and uh, you're gonna train your dog to salivate to a tone. Maybe you don't have a tuning fork like Pavlov had, maybe, but you can snap your fingers. Could you train your dog to salivate to a finger snap? Sure you can. So all you do is what? Snap your fingers and then put the food in the dog's mouth. Snap your fingers, put the food. Snap your fingers, put the food. Snap your fingers, put the food, and so on and so on. And even, you know, seven, 10, a dozen times is often enough to get the dog to salivate uh, just to the finger snap. And you can actually see the drool start to drip down. So let's say that you've gotten your dog to train to salivate mightily uh, to your finger snap, and you now decide, I'm gonna go around town and I'm gonna show my friends. So you put the dog in the car, and you drive to the first friend's house, you show them, you snap your fingers, the dog salivates all over, and you say, isn't that cool? You go on to your next friend's house, snap your fingers, the dog salivates, but a bit less. Third friend's house, dog salivates to the finger snap, but not too much. Fourth friend's, maybe a little drop or two, or maybe I see something to your fifth friend, uh, nothing. So what's going on here? Is the dog getting tired? Is it that uh, it's trying to make a fool of you? No, this is the response of extinction will naturally occur when we present an unconditioned stimulus without uh, or conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus over and over again. Okay, another thing that was identified by Pavlov was that of spontaneous recovery. So here, Pavlov has trained the dog to salivate strongly to a tone. He has then extinguished the response by um, providing the tone without any uh, food being provided. So the dog no longer salivates. Then there's a pause. So Pavlov goes off and I don't know, has, takes a little break uh, maybe he goes and has a little vodka or whatever, a Russian guy or whatever. So he comes back from his vodka break and then uh, he says, ah, what the hell, I'm going to try sounding the tone. And he sounds the tone and lo and behold, the dog once again uh, begins salivating to the tone, though it hadn't before his break. Ah, this is what we call raw spontaneous recovery the return of a conditioned stimulus after a break in conditioning. Now, if he continues to sound the tone without providing food, it will again extinguish. Let me tell you about a situation with humans where this might come into play. Let's say we have a clinical psychologist whose client has a problem with um, or, uh, phobia of heights, okay, acrophobia. Um, so that's a problem for his client because the client's job requires him to climb up on ladders from time to time. Um, now, how did the client get that way? Well, likely what happened is he may have had a fall of some sort that then uh, is associated with getting up on something high. So now whenever he gets up on a ladder, he feels fear. Well, we can get him to overcome 
that fear, if we can get him to uh, climb up on the ladder repeatedly and nothing bad happens. So notice that we're having the, what well, we're having the unconditioned, uh, the neutral stimulus no longer being followed by the unconditioned stimulus or the conditioned stimulus not being followed by the uh, unconditioned stimulus. No fall, no pain, okay? So eventually that fear extinguishes. Now, here's where spontaneous recovery comes into play. So at the end of our session today, he's doing fine, climbing the ladder, not feeling fear. But a week later when he comes in for a follow-up, guess what? It's quite likely that as he begins to climb the ladder this time, there will be some return of that, uh, that condition response, and he may begin to feel some fear, probably less than he originally did, okay? So what we may have to do in therapy for um, this kind of problem is we may have to extinguish that condition response uh, three or four times maybe until we finally can extinguish it once for all. We might have to have several sessions doing that. Okay, that's where that comes in. So Pavlov also identified a phenomenon, phenomenon that we know as a stimulus generalization. He had trained a dog to salivate two vibrations on its thigh. How did he do that? Well, you a little vibrating device, attach, uh, you know, put it on the dog's thigh, and then every time he would vibrate the thing, the dog would get food put in its mouth. So salivate to vibrations on his thigh. He then began to move the vibrations around to different parts of the dog's body and noted how much saliva was produced. You can see the results here on the chart. So what he found is the dog produced the most saliva in the exact area where it was trained, the thigh. As the vibrations were moved around the dog's body, the closer the vibrations were to the original training site, the more salivating occurred, the more the dog generalized. The further away they were, the less salivation that was produced, but it always produced some salivating. So we say the dog generalized. Now, the flip side of this is what we call stimulus discrimination. This is a learned ability to distinguish between a conditioned stimulus and other stimuli. So for example, when Pavlov first began training dogs to salivate to a tone, he used a 256 cycles per second tone. And as the dogs we're beginning to learn this. At first, with very little experience, they would salivate to all kinds of tones that were similar. So they generalized early in that conditioning process. But as more conditioning trials were uh, done, the dogs got pickier and pickier about the tones that they would salivate to till eventually only that 256 hertz tone produced salivation, no other tone. So this is known as stimulus discrimination. Now, you can also see both of these occurring in humans quite readily, and I'll give you a case in point. So when, um, let's say we have a little girl and uh, she has a bad experience with the dog, okay? The dog did something mean. So she may generalize and show a fear of not just that dog, but any dog. In fact, maybe even anything that's furry like a dog and has four legs. On the other hand, with more experience after that, she may come to find that, oh, you know what? Um, you don't have to be afraid of all dogs. It's only what? That specific dog that I need to be afraid of. So she begins to discriminate amongst dogs rather than generalizing. This is all 
uh, very common with us humans as well. Okay. Now, the early behaviorists like um, John Watson that we're going to see, as well as some of the others, um, believe that learned behaviors were just mindless mechanisms, that there was no awareness that was a part of it that made any difference, that there was no um, real information processing going on mentally. It was just our nervous system forming some association apart from any mental process. That idea had to change when cognitive psychologists came along in the 1970s and started studying mental processes, including those involved in conditioning. So one example is a study done by Riscorla and Wagner. And what they did is they had, um, they had rats and one group of rats, by the way, the rats all the same, okay? Uh, one group of rats would hear a tone that was followed consistently by a shock every time. Their other, other, other group of rats, excuse me, uh, the other group of rats would hear the same number of tones and receive the same number of shocks, but they were occurring just at random. So which group of rats began to respond to the tones with fear type behaviors? Well, if you guess the group where the tone was always followed by a shock consistently, you're right. They were able to learn that the tone uh, meant a shock was coming, showed a fear response to it. The other rats didn't make that association, although the tone, the shocks were unpleasant, obviously. So in their study, then they found that rats responded to the indicator, the stimulus, that was a better predictor of what was going to happen next. And so they also surmised that stimulus that are good predictors of the next event produce an expectancy, a mental thing, okay? And that, that expectation then was, could be part of the conditioning process as well. Now, just to give you an example of this as well, let's say that we're in a classroom. And so every day when I walk in as the instructor, I have a clipboard and uh, I walk past you and I wrap you over the top of the head with that clipboard. Eh, maybe not hard, but you know, enough to be unpleasant, right? So you may eventually begin to automatically wince when I'm coming over there, uh, approaching. But here's another thing. Is there something mental that might accompany that? And I think a lot of you would say, yeah, it probably is. You probably gonna say, ah, here he comes. I know what he's gonna do, right? There's an expectation that goes along with it. So we have learned this is possible and how we think about the stimulus also plays a part in the conditioning. Now, having said that, conditioning can occur without our awareness at all, but sometimes it's also accompanied by expectation of the next uh, stimulus. This also, um, this cognitive process also comes up, for example, aversive training for alcoholics. Aversive training is where the person who's trying to quit drinking can volunteer to take a drug that will make them violently ill when they drink alcohol, make them vomit. So, when you do that, uh, quite obviously, you will begin to find alcohol to be disgusting because your nervous system begins to associate it with uh, vomiting and nausea. So that can be really helpful 
uh, in the early stages of trying to overcome an alcohol problem. Now here's the problem with it though. The alcoholic knows that the illness was due to the um, medication that they took. And so for that reason then, after treatment is over, they may decide, well, I'm just going to go ahead and go back to it. And maybe the first time or two, it might make them feel somewhat sick. Um, but eventually, they may come back to drinking. So that's why we also have to address the other reasons the person might be drinking uh, when we work with uh, people with substance abuse problems. Um, because uh, just physically, doing something to help them overcome it may not be enough. There may be mental, uh, psychological aspects of the problem as well that need to be dealt with. Now, the early behaviorists also assume that the laws of learning, as they called them, were the same for all animals, and they included people in that category. Later, we learned that learning is limited, constrained by an animal's biology. We found certain species could not learn certain associations that others can. So not all species are the same in terms of the associations they can make. Here's an example of this. Experiments on the phenomenon of conditioned taste aversion revealed this. So what they did is they took rats and they had them drink sweetened water, um, put some sweetener in it, and then after drinking that water, the rats were sickened with some radiation enough to make them nauseous. Now the nausea didn't occur though for several hours after uh, the uh, drinking the water. Interestingly, even once of this occurring, rats after this experience would not drink sweetened water. They would not touch it. Now, they brought in a new group of rats, naive, in other words, they hadn't been through this, and in this case, rather than giving them sweetened water, they gave them colored water and then sickened them with radiation. These rats continued to drink the colored water as if nothing had happened. They were not able to make an association between the color of the water and the illness. Now, on the other hand, the same sort of procedure was done with pigeons. These birds, uh, they gave one group of birds um, the sweetened water and sickened them also. And the birds continued to drink sweetened water, no problem, as if nothing had happened. So they were not able to learn that the taste of the water uh, was associated with this uh, nausea. On the other hand, a new group of pigeons brought in, were given colored water, then sickened. They wouldn't touch the colored water for anything. They were able to associate the colored water with the nausea. So notice the species were different in their associations they could learn. Now you might think a bit more about that. Why would they be different? Well, think about how these species um, obtain their food. How do rats obtain their food? Mostly rats are going around in dark places and mostly by what? Smell and taste. They identify their food. Therefore, they can learn associations uh, by taste. On the other hand, how do birds obtain their food? It's mostly visual, right? They're visual hunters for food. And so they were able to make an association between a visual stimulus and nausea, but not uh, taste stimulus. Now, this condition taste aversion, this responding to uh, making an association after just one trial of uh, association 
is very unusual. It's a very unusual type of classical conditioning known as what? Avoidance of stimuli followed by nausea or sickness. Um, what's unusual about it, it's one trial conditioning. Only one time it has to happen. And also it's unusual because there is an unusual time lapse duration between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Um, so in, in human sort of um, experience, a lot of you probably have had experience where you went somewhere and you ate something and maybe later on, maybe even hours later, you got sick. And ever since that, you can't stand that food that you had before you got sick. In some cases, it might also uh, be you can't stand the restaurant where you had had that food. It doesn't even have to be that the food made you sick. You could have gotten sick for other reasons, but still detest the food that you had before you got sick. I won't go into details about my experience on that, but yeah. Um, what's also kind of interesting about this, it's often very difficult to extinguish because, yeah, you don't ever eat that food, so you continue to have that condition response. Now, this also led to a very interesting little scenario. John Garcia was one of the researchers who studied this, lived in an area where there was sheep ranching, and the ranchers there were having some problems with coyotes and they even had wolves, uh, coyotes and wolves eating their sheep. And so Garcia, being a smart guy, they went to him and said, you think you could help us out? You know, we're having this problem. Garcia says, yes, uh, actually what you need to do is take some sheep carcasses and put a little poison on them, not enough to kill uh, coy the coyotes or wolves, but enough to make them good and sick if they eat some of that tainted meat. So the ranchers did this and found out, lo and behold, within days, coyotes and wolves who had eaten the uh, poison carcasses uh, can would begin to avoid sheep. They would literally go the other way uh, when sheep were nearby. Uh, they happened to trap one of those predators and they had it in a uh, trap that was near a sheep pen. And <laughs> I think it was a coyote, I think. And it would stay as far away from the sheep as possible on the opposite end of that trap, uh, as far away as it could. So it was kind of interesting though. This was used as a uh, humane predator control, if you will, it's kind of interesting. Now, this may come into play with humans in terms of chemotherapy treatments. Some of those drugs used in chemotherapy produce nausea and natural response, reflex response to the drug. In some cases, this can produce then classically conditioned nausea to cues that were present before the person received the drug, such as even the waiting room where the person received was before they received the treatment. So often what they will do is try to rotate those stimuli that the person um, encounters before the treatment. Even in terms of foods, they may have um, a classical conditioned uh, taste aversion to foods they've eaten before their treatment. So they often will instruct people to eat something that they normally don't eat so that it's not something that's one of their staple foods that case they do develop that. Okay, so a couple applications of this before we move on to uh, emotional conditioning. Um, classical conditioning in terms of drug rehabilitation. Let's say you're a chemically, a chemical dependency counselor working with clients who are trying to get off of drugs. So one of the things that you will tell your clients is you need to stay away from the people, the places, and the things that were present when you used to do the drug. Why? Because if you do encounter those people, places, things, they will tr produce this classically conditioned response of anticipating the sensation of the drug and therefore will create a craving for the drug. So uh, we may have to even 
uh, put them in a different environment for a time uh, while we work with them. Now, here's another potential use of this. Uh, this was demonstrated by Adder and Cohen. They did research in which they produce classically conditioned immune suppression. So first of all, you might say, well, why would anybody be interested in suppressing the immune system? Isn't this the thing that fights off disease and illness, and keeps us from getting cancer and stuff like that? And yes, it is. However, there are certain situations where it's necessary to suppress the immune system. For example, if the person receives an organ transplant, they must suppress the immune system so that the person doesn't reject that transplanted organ uh, that came from someone else's body. So the way that they produced this experimentally was Adder and Cohen presented an immune suppressing drug to volunteers. It was given in a liquid that had a specific flavor, specific scent, specific taste. So being given the drug in that, let's call it a Kool-Aid, okay? Of course, when given the Kool-Aid with the drug, they were able to measure immune suppression. They then had the subjects uh, take the uh, drug uh, administered with the Kool-Aid a number of times, and then uh, the Kool-Aid was presented without the drug. They found that now just drinking the Kool-Aid now also produce immune suppression. Same response as Now, to my knowledge, this has not yet been used clinically. Um, it's kind of be hard to test it on a larger group of people, but um, there are a couple things that you might have to also take care of, even if it were used. Uh, this would work, uh, but we would have to make sure we prevented extinction from occurring. So if we continue to simply uh, administer the Kool-Aid without the drug, eventually the immune suppression response would taper off and would cease. So what we would have to do is from time to time, the Kool-Aid would need to uh, also contain the drug. But if you think about this, this could be very useful because some of those immune suppressing drugs have some pretty nasty side effects. If they could do this, the person would be exposed to much less of the actual medication yet receive a similar benefit. So maybe something will happen, um, will be used in your lifetime. So next we look at how John Watson uh, was uh, discovered that classical conditioning could also produce not just physical responses, but also could produce emotional responses. So John Watson was a psychologist, early 1900s, working with an assistant named Rosalie Rayner, who had this little baby named Albert. So this has uh, kind of been uh, known as the Little Albert experiment. So Little Albert uh, was in Watson's lab many times and had seen a white rat there and showed no fear of it before the experiment. Watson's uh, hypothesis was that emotional responses were due to classical conditioning, so he set out to test that with Albert. So what he did is he then uh, brought Albert into his lab every day and then he would turn the white rat loose and as soon as Albert saw it, Watson would make a loud noise from behind a curtain and scare the heck out of Albert. Now Albert, of course, responded as any little baby did would and became afraid, cried, and so forth. 
So Watson repeated this procedure daily for seven days. Then he brought in Albert, turned the rat loose. And as soon as Albert saw it, even though this time Watson did not make the loud noise, um, Albert began to cry and run away from, crawl away from the rat. Uh, he showed fear of the rat now without any loud noise required. So Watson had indeed demonstrated a condition emotional response. Now, just to help us kind of review on our, um, on our terminology for classical conditioning, Let's see if I can bring up my whiteboard here. Gosh, that should, should look like that. I hope that's on your screen. Let me double check it. Yeah, okay. So I guess you're seeing that, okay. So let's see, first of all, at first, oh, this is upside down. How can I fix that? Can you guys see upside down? Uh, I don't know, turn your device upside down. <laughs> I don't know if I can fix that. Try. Oh, here we go, how about this? Oh, there we are, okay. So notice that the rat produced no fear response. So originally the rat is a neutral stimulus. So Watson now begins to pair up the rat, which is still a neutral stimulus, with a loud noise. Babies are naturally, naturally afraid of loud noises, so this is going to be an unconditioned stimulus. And of course, the natural response of any normal baby is going to be fear. So we can say fear is an unconditioned response. So far, so good. So Watson repeats this a number of times. Then he simply presents the rat to Albert. And Albert now shows fear of the rat no loud noise. So now the rat has become a conditioned stimulus and fear is being produced as a conditioned response. Okay, now a few other little things to look at here with this. Okay, you can see in this diagram, uh, reiterates the same thing before conditioning. Albert has no fear of the rat conditioning the rat is paired up with the loud noise, naturally revoking a fear response. After conditioning, child now is afraid of the rat, um, conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. Now, generalization also occurred, stimulus generalization. Um, Albert was afraid of anything that was white and furry, okay? Um, a stuffed animal, it was white and furry, uh, white furry boots, Watson's beard, which is, was also white and fuzzy. So anything. Um, so he said, that's terrible, right? Um, is Albert gonna be like that for life? Now, a lot of you might say, well, maybe not. Maybe he'll get over it. Maybe he'll, what? Uh, the fear will wear off, so you say that. Well, in conditioning terms, what would we say? Well, it's possible that extinction might occur. Ah, if he encounters numerous other white and furry things, but there's no loud noise, there's no scary thing that happens, then yes, that fear might extinguish. Now, having said all that, you should also note that Watson today would not be allowed to perform this experiment. Uh, it would be considered unethical, scaring little babies and potentially producing some 
long-term harm uh, would not be permitted. Okay, so there you go. There's the story of little Albert. All right, so we're gonna stop there. <laughs> Sorry to stop, it was kind of a downer, right? Uh, but we'll have some more fun things next time. So um, we'll call that it and pick up with uh, our conditioning next time.